Established in 1936, the Orsted Medal, honoring the Danish physicist Hans Christian Orsted, who lived from 1777 to 1851, is presented at each winter meeting to a person who has had an outstanding, widespread, and lasting impact on the teaching of physics. I invite Charles Holbrook, please, to join me on the podium. He has been an active member of AAPT since January of 1962, has served on numerous AAPT committees and task forces, served on a four-year term uh, from 2001 to 2005 in the AAPT presidential chain, and also has several months as AAPT executive officer. On a more personal front, he provided immense support for my younger son when he, my son, matriculated in the MAT program at Colgate. Uh, I have known Charlie for at least two decades. The Orsted Medal is presented to him, however, for his contributions to physics teaching during his long tenure at Colgate University, including activities at numerous sites outside of Colgate. I invite you to read the full citation that is printed in the on-site guide for this meeting. I'm pleased and honored, Charlie, uh, to present the 2012 Orsted Medal to you. The full award consists of a monetary prize, the Orsted Medal, and a framed certificate that he can hang on the wall of his office. We will take some pictures later on. Uh, Dr. Holbrook's Orsted Lecture is titled, Making Physics Make Sense, Narrative, Content, and Fits. I'm going to give it the German pronunciation. Very good, David. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. So thank you very much, David, for that introduction. I think uh, you probably don't realize this is the second time that I have received the Earth State Medal. Uh, the first time was when Bernie Puri loaned me one for, <laughs> for an exhibit that we were doing in honor of the APS Centennial in 1999. This is much better. I, uh, for one thing, I get to keep the medal. And for the other, it is a very great honor, and I'm deeply appreciative of it, and I have many, many colleagues to thank for that. Uh, I feel a little guilty about it, because it does seem to me that an honor of this uh, magnitude should have been achieved through a lot of suffering and uh, excessive effort. And uh, in fact, of course, what I'm doing is I'm getting the medal for having an awful lot of fun doing something that I love very much. And, uh, I do love physics. I mean, I love uh, all kinds of aspects of it. I love its stories. You know, I love that we live under an ocean of air. I love that uh, moving clocks run slow, that electrons go through two slits at once. Uh, I love the scope of its concepts, uh, of the fact that momentum, angular momentum, and energy will work for the very largest parts of the universe. I love that they will work for the smallest things in the universe, and they'll work for everything in between. Uh, it is just a, a wonderful field. Uh, in which to uh, uh, exercise one's imagination, have one's imagination developed. Uh, in fact, I think you know, physics really uh, takes our imagination to the farthest reaches of the universe and to the innermost recesses. Uh, physics is the language of the universe. The universe speaks to us in physics. Now, Fortunately, if I feel guilty about getting this award, my guilt is assuaged by the fact that I have a responsibility, which is to give an address. I, I, I don't know, address has a very somber sound to me, and I'm probably not up to that. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm probably going to give a talk, right? And I'm going to uh, tell some stories. And I'm going to tell some stories uh, that are basically physics stories to illustrate what I uh, what I mean by narrative in physics, and why I think narrative is important, why I think narrative deserves more attention than we give it. I think we all use narratives, and we all know they're important, but uh, sometimes we uh, need, I think, to be more conscious of that. Now, my stories are from my own work. That's the easy way to do this. And, uh, uh, but of course, my own work uh, depends on contributions and collaborations of many, many colleagues 
uh, far too many for me to list in the amount of here that would take up the rest of my talk. Uh, so I think, I hope they will forgive me for me not going through an explicit uh, account on who they are and what they've done for me. Well, I start by giving you an analogy, and it's this. Uh, suppose you want to read War and Peace in the original. You have a lot of work to do. You have to take courses in Russian. You have to learn a whole new alphabet, which is Cyrillic. You have to uh, learn uh, a, a whole set of declensions of a complicated way of uh, inflecting your nouns and your adjectives. You have to learn a complex structure of conjugations. You have to learn thousands of words of vocabulary, thousands of idioms of uh, you know, no obvious uh, content until you understand them. Uh, and, and then when you get done, uh, yes, you probably will be able to read Voina Imir in the original. And it's a wonderful story. It's got a tremendous narrative power. Uh, it is, I think, worth the effort. Although you may be a little surprised to find that it starts out in French, but that's something for you after you've gone through the Russian. <laughs> um, but, but here you see that I think there are some parallels with, with physics and physics education. You know, in physics we learn mathematics, which is a kind of grammar, and we learn uh, units, which is a kind of uh, alphabet, really. Uh, we have to uh, learn a lot of definitions of terms so that they come to mean something other than to be accustomed to them. And that would be our vocabulary. Uh, you might think of equations and concepts and laws as, as idioms that we have to learn. You have to learn a lot of uh, grammar and syntax before you can understand stories that are being told to you in the language of physics. Now, that's my point though. It, it, you don't do that just for the heck of it, although we sometimes try to convince our students that they should. We do it because we have some stories to tell, and we would like them to understand those stories. We would like them to be able to tell their own stories, their own physics stories. So they do need to learn this stuff. But it's the narrative that is the point. It's the ability to understand narratives and to make up your own. So that's what I mean when I say the universe speaks to us in physics, and we learn the language of physics to understand what the universe is saying to us. Now, that's somewhat of an exaggeration, because, well, the exaggeration that I'm making here is that uh, uh, physics is not taught without narratives. We all know that narratives are important. We have uh, a collection of kind of mini narratives that we want to use as we're teaching in the beginning courses, kind of the way a language teacher does. A good language teacher doesn't just make you learn a whole lot of vocabulary and, kind of, and verb forms and all this kind of stuff. A good language teacher right away has you sort of doing Dick and Jane narratives, talking to one another in short paragraphs about, you know, the, the, the pen of my aunt or whatever. And, uh, and, and we do that in physics, although there I think uh, in the beginning physics we have some uh, burden that we bear in that a lot of our mini narratives uh, get to be a bit stale and old, they're kind of a burden for the teachers or they become automatic uh, in a way that uh, reminds us of what Don Holcomb has called the, the frozen syllabus of physics. And, uh, and I, I want to argue as I go along that the narrative is uh, can be liberated and can help us thaw that frozen syllabus. So, I need to give a talk uh, of some seriousness. I mean, look at how serious that man looks. That's, that's a consequence, I suppose, of having a picture taken by the daguerreotype. He <laughs> lived long enough for that to happen. And, uh, uh, and you see the medal there, which I see close up here, uh, that it shows him discovering that electric current produces a magnetic field. As he was lecturing, uh, I wish I could hope to have uh, some similar achievement here, but probably uh, I'll settle for uh, uh, less. Anyway, I, I'm going to start with a narrative, uh, sort of one of my earliest efforts to get a narrative in physics, and it's in a way an obvious one. It's called uh, a course that I developed called The Physics of Living in Space. And this came out of uh, a summer study that I attended uh, in 1976, uh, at which NASA, uh, 75 actually, and NASA had 
a sponsored a group of uh, engineers and physicists and social scientists and asked them to develop a system, design a system for living in space. The central feature of which was a habitat, an orbiting city that would hold 10,000 people, presumably safely and uh, uh, able to live pleasantly. Well, I, I can't tell you about the whole system. It's too long, it's too complex. So I'm going to focus on maybe one or two aspects of it uh, here and uh, show you how um, a little physics and some physiology and some sociology dictates a structure. Uh, and that, I thought, was a very uh, useful experience for our students. And so here is the issue. If uh, We know from the experience of our astronauts that they, uh, uh, relative short time in space, uh, they start to show uh, muscle loss, uh, calcium loss, bone density loss. Uh, there's rather rapid uh, consequences of living in, uh, uh, well, they call it zero G, but of course what we mean is living in weightlessness. And, uh, and so we said, if you're going to have a habitat with 10,000 people and they're all going to live there for a long time, they better have some gravity. And in fact, they better have one G. That's, that's, he said something very uh, significant when he goes to build a structure. And I'll be willing to bet your money if the first one that's up there won't be one G, but you'll see why in a second. And, uh, and then the next thing is, it's going to have to be a rotating system. That's how you make your pseudo gravity. So how would you do this? Uh, well, you have to rotate it. How fast? And again, you come, here comes a little physiology that 3 RPM uh, is, a, is, a, is a little fast for maybe 10% of the people who might live in such a thing. You get Coriolis effects in the inner ear, and it's rather unpleasant, and some fraction will not adapt. But most, most of us would. But. So we again made a conservative decision as a design team. We said, not... Uh, uh, not three RPM, we'll go with one RPM. That's also a very significant decision because it now specifies the overall structure. And you can see here, I think, I, I can't even, I guess this point it works, right? Oh, yeah, excellent. So here you just look and you see that E squared over R, centripetal acceleration is going to G, and you express V in terms of the angular velocity of omega. And what you're asking is that omega squared R equal G, the acceleration of gravity, and so R is specified, once you specify G and the RPM rate, and in fact you put the numbers in, and it's 895 meters. And so you're immediately talking about a structure that's over a mile in diameter. And so we're saying we're going to have a structure that goes from here to here uh, over a mile. Now the next thing that you've got to decide if, once, you, once you've done this is what should be the diameter of the tube itself? This again uh, has a, a big consequence because a small diameter will save you a lot of construction material. You can build this with many fewer tons. A large diameter means a lot. In fact, Jerry O'Neill, who was the originator of this, you may remember his name, uh, aspired to have a cylinder uh, 895 meters in radius, over a mile in diameter. And uh, that's a whole story in itself. But, we went here with what was called subsequently the Stanford Taurus. Oops, I the wrong way. And uh, it's shown here on the. Uh, uh, your left. No, yes, your left. My left. Okay. So, and what you, what you've ended up designing is a giant bicycle wheel. Because we took the diameter of the inner tube on which people are going to live. They're going to live with their feet sticking out along the uh, rubber tire part of the bicycle wheel. Uh, we, we took that to be 130 meters across, 65 meter radius. Turns out to give you a projected area of about 65 square meters per person, which is not a lot. And so, because we were partly in the sales business, and to our surprise, uh, we said, you can live with this because there are places on Earth that are charming that have 65 square meters per person. And this is a perched village in the south, southern France. So. The idea is that if you go and live in this space habitat, it would be like living in southern France. In any case, Monaco has a density of about 60, or not a density, uh, uh, area per person of about 65 square meters per person. So, so I give you that as an example of how a narrative picks you up and takes you to places you might not otherwise go. And in this case, we also spent a certain amount of time, of course, talking about the difference between engineering and physics. Uh, because it was a natural context in which to do that. 